Lexington Women's Club, I would like to welcome you to the 32nd annual Meet the Candidates Night. My name is Kathy Hebden, and I'll be the moderator for this program. The Hopkinton Women's Club was founded in 1920 when women were gaining the right to vote. And each year we organize Candidates Night to help all citizens determine how to cast their ballot in the upcoming town election. We always welcome new members to the Women's Club and encourage anyone interested in our scholarship and community service organization to visit our website at hopkintonwomensclub.org. Our format this evening will begin with an opening statement from every candidate. Each one will have a limit of two minutes for their remarks. The time is this evening include women's club members and volunteers from the local high school. They will hold up a sign periodically to indicate how much speaking time is left. If necessary, they will ring a bell to signify the end of two minutes, and then we will move on. Audience members, please hold your applause until all of the opening statements have been completed. Now, on to our first speaker. For town clerk, Connor Deegan, candidate for re-election nomination papers. I promise I'll be short because I'm uncontested, so I don't want to waste your time. We have so many amazing candidates who are stepping up for office right now. Uh, thank you so much to the Women's Club for hosting this and HCAM for having us here this evening. I, I just really wanted to briefly uh, emphasize some of the things that I've been able to work on in the past three years and to really thank everyone who was so supportive three years ago when I first started out on this journey. Uh, since then, I am now uh, just a hop, skip, and a jump away from getting my certifications for, uh, for being a clerk. I, I'll probably have my certified municipal clerk status within few months of my re-election if, uh, if you choose to, to do so. And beyond that, I've been able to work with so many community organizations that have made my job so much easier to work at increasing civic engagement, to uh, working with groups at, at building community, and also just making it so that everyone knows all the information is available to them from my office and that they can always reach out to me as a resource. Uh, thank you so much again for having me. I, I will see the rest of my time so that other candidates can have a chance to speak about their platforms. Thank you. Thank you. For Tom Moderator, Thomas Garabedian, candidate for re-election Republican across the county. Thank you, Kathy, and thank you to the Women's Club for hosting us uh, once again. <clears throat> Um, I've served the town in a variety of capacities over the years, most recently as town moderator. Uh, early on in, in uh, our tenure in town, I served on the school committee and served as a commissioner of trust funds and then had a, a short 15-year stint as a member of the Zoning Board of Appeals. I've been privileged to serve as town moderator. Uh, I committed uh, three years ago to being informed on the issues that will come before town meeting, to be nonpartisan in terms of the conduct of the meeting, and to, be, to, to conduct a meeting that's efficiently run so that we're mindful and respectful of the time of those Hopkinton voters who do end up participating in our town meeting. I uh, look forward to our discussion this evening, and I hope you'll consider me uh, as your candidate for town moderator. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Good evening. I'm Ellen Rudder, and I'm really excited to be running for town moderator. As your moderator, I'd be the presiding officer of annual town meeting. You may recognize me from town meeting. Last May, I was a deputy moderator and in February, I was acting moderator at our special town meeting. I really had a lot of fun doing both of those two jobs. You could also recognize me from around town. I've raised my two sons here in Hopkinton. We've been here since 2000 and appreciated the fabulous schools and many wonderful town programs. Professionally, my job is running meetings. Have you ever seen a big pharma ad where there are all these happy people and then lots and lots and lots of words? I facilitate and review ad meetings for a Boston Pharma company. We have lots of stakeholders, including the FDA. My job is to ensure that the meetings are fair, effective, and efficient. 
as your moderator, I will use these same strong facilitation skills at town meeting. Hopkinton is growing. We have more residents, more projects, bigger budgets. We residents have the opportunity to participate in governing at town meeting. This year, we'll be talking schools, the fire department, infrastructure, and an almost $100 million budget. As Hopkinton's town moderator, I will commit to ensuring that all voices are heard, that our town meeting is efficient, and we keep moving forward together. Thank you. For the Board of, Selection, Board of Selectmen, Mary Jo Lafrenia, Democratic Caucus nominee. And this is in alphabetical order. Good evening. I want to say thank you to the Women's Club and HCAM. And I want to say hi to all of you that are watching from home. Uh, and I'll tell you something about myself so that you know who I am. I've lived in town for over 40 years. And I, the minute I came to Hopkinton, I loved it and I still love it. I brought up two sons here, um, and they are all grown up now. They went to the through the Hoppington school system, and they um, love the natural resources that we are blessed with in this town. They spent most of their time outdoors and in the woods, and it's a wonderful, wonderful place to bring up children. <coughs> I was a past employee of the town, which is kind of unique. I was... Uh, with the Board of Assessors here a number of years ago. Uh, as the Deputy Assessor, I spent 10 years being employed by the Town of Hopkinton. And then I worked for the State Senate for 10 years, State Senator David Mignani, who uh, represented Hopkinton and the surrounding communities, and I was his district director. I'm a Massachusetts accredited assessor, and I've been a professional assessor for the towns of Holliston and Plainville doing things like the recap sheet, budgeting, and we did not have a CEO in that town, so a lot of that work falls to the Board of Assessors. Uh, during that time, I was elected to the board here in Hopkinton, and I have, I am serving currently still, and uh, enjoying it, but this is my last year. Uh, oops. <laughs> I believe that I can with my backgrounds, state, municipal, and financial, that I can assist Hopkinton in its uh, growing problems and in its and help it move forward into the future. Thank you. For the Board of Selectmen, Shahidul Manon, Democratic Hello. Caucus nominee. There we go. Hello, good evening. First, I would like to thank the Women's Club for organizing this wonderful event. This event shows the strength of our foundation of our democracy and reminds us that it all starts here in a small town like ours. Thank you all for joining. My name is Shahid Manan and I'm running for Selectman. I came to US 24 years ago to get my MBA in finance. My wife Nasiba and I moved to Hopkinton seven years ago to raise our kids in a beautiful town with great schools. My son Ryan is a senior in Hopkinton High getting ready for college and daughter Raina going to fourth grade in Hopkins. I am running because as we enjoy the community resources, we believe in giving back. My dad was active in community services and taught us the same values. That is why I joined the Appropriations Committee four years ago, as soon as we came to this town. I am running because Hopkinton is going through an important growth and transition time, and I can add value with my strategic leadership, planning, and budget experience. I have decades of professional experience as a corporate and technology leader, leading large departments, programs, managing software business of my own, and for large enterprise, most recently for EMC and now at uh, Partners Healthcare. Combining this with my appropriations committee experience, I will bring a unique strategic perspective with focus on problem solving with creativity and collaboration. As your next selectman, I will focus on keeping our schools strong, taxes in check, and managing growth. I believe in one Hopkinton and will work with everyone to ensure what's best for this town and what's best for our lives. I humbly ask for your vote for this opportunity on May 20. Thank you. Thank you. For the Board of Selectmen, Brendan Tedstone, candidate for re-election, 
nomination papers. Good evening. My name is Brendan Tedstone. <clears throat> I've lived in Hopkinton for my entire life. I'm the sixth generation of my family to live here. My kids make it a seventh. I've never voted in a town other than Hopkinton. I'm finishing up my first term as selectman in May and hope that you'll vote for me so I can serve a second. <coughs> Professionally, I'm a full-time nurse manager in a dementia unit. I deal with very sensitive and emotionally charged situations each and every day. I rest my hat on my decision-making process in that it's nothing but honest and fair. We as a board have tackled some pretty complex issues in town over the last few years, of which I'm very proud. To name a few are maintaining our impressive public school rankings, being voted the safest town and city in the country, furthering the downtown revitalization project, the Lichen Bioscience TIF, seeing the completion of the new public library, the Thomas McIntyre DPW building, and the Marathon Elementary School. Under the leadership, I just lost myself there. Under the leadership of our current board, we've remained fiscally prudent while keeping services at or above what is expected from a motivated workforce in town. We debate openly and respectfully to promote civility on the board. I'm proud of the strides we have made over the last three years and look to continue momentum moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. For the Board of Selectmen, Claire Wright, Republican candidate for re-election, nomination papers. Good evening. My name is Claire Wright, and I'm running for re-election to your Board of Selectmen. First, I'd like to thank the Women's Club for um, hosting this annual election kickoff event for our town voters. I'm running for re-election because in these times of rapid growth and change, Hopkinton needs continued, experienced leadership. Someone who has demonstrated their commitment to our town and a selectman who will work for fiscal responsibility and balanced growth and services. I offer leadership focused on keeping Hopkinton a prosperous and well-managed town and maintaining our strong schools, our community character, and our quality of life. I've lived in Hopkinton for almost 40 years, almost my entire adult life. And for about 30 of those, I've served this town on a wide variety of boards and committees, such as Design Review, Fruit Street Master Plan, Historic District, and including three elected terms, 15 years, on the planning board. All, in my opinion, as teachers and qualifiers to serve in our town's highest office, the Board of Selectmen. It's not just years on a calendar. It's knowing our town, who we are, where we've been, and where we're going. It's understanding town government, where to go, who to see, knowing the facts, and how to get things done. As your selectman, I will continue to bring you strong and respectful leadership, enriched by a depth of understanding and a demonstrated commitment to our town. Thank you. For the Board of Assessors, for three years, vote for one. Tonight we have Gunajit Medi nomination papers. Thank you, Kathy. My name is Guna Jitmeri. Some folks in town know, know me as Guna. I'm running as an independent candidate for the Board of Assessors Office. Before I begin with the rest of my statement, I'd like to thank the Hopkinton Women's Club for organizing this event. I live on Hayden Rose Street with my wife, Tanya, and our three children, Neil, Kunal, and Alicia. My eldest son, Neil, goes to the Hopkinton High School. The middle son, Kunal, goes to Hopkins and my youngest just started, uh, Alicia just started at the Marathon School. Background-wise, I have a bachelor's degree in aeronautical engineering, a master of science degree in mechanical engineering, and an MBA. I have over 25 years of engineering and management experience, and yes, I work at Dell EMC right up the street at South Street, so you can literally say that I live and work in town. I'm running for this position as I'm always looking for new ways to give back to the community. Over the last two years, I've been a member of the Hopkinton Little League Board. I fix the fields. I work on the equipment for the board. 
And um, this year, uh, this spring, I hope to be an assistant coach, or I'm assisting as an assistant coach on my son's 11U team. Like many others in town, I've attended several meetings and EHOP events. I've also met with several others who are currently active on the elected positions in town or have served in the past. Having those interactions and with support from friends and family, I've decided to actively participate in the dialogue towards creating sustainable solutions to the property tax challenge. My candidacy for this position is a start on that journey. If elected on May 20th, I will patiently listen to both the long-term and new residents of our town, and I will cooperatively work with fellow board members and other elected officials to find new and innovative solutions to our town's many opportunities. I respectfully request your vote on May 20th. Thank you. Thank you. For Commission of Trust Funds, three-year position for one, Susan Curie's Democratic Caucus nominee. Hi, I'm Susan Curie's, and I also want to thank uh, Nancy and the Hockington Women's Club and HCAM for creating this opportunity for us. Um, uh, I'm running for Commissioner of Trust Funds. Uh, it's a three-member board that's chartered to oversee several trust funds that were bequeathed to the town. Recently, I've been supporting my parents. They're 86 and 87 years old and thankfully very healthy. Uh, but they've been revisiting their estate plans. And one of the things that's really struck me about that is that there's something in us that when we value, we truly value something, we're moved to pass it on to others and to make certain that they can carry the torch forward. The stewardship of this type of legacy is what the commissioners are all about. The, the commissioners have three principal duties. The first is managing and controlling the funds. The second is ensuring that the very complicated and strict legal terms of each trust are adhered to. And the last is ensuring that the wishes of the benefactors are honored. My service to the town and to this community have made me prepared for this role. I'm currently a clerk of the Tax Relief Fund Committee. Tax Relief is a committee that grants um, relief to senior and disabled residents of Hopkinton to ease the burden of our increasing tax rates. In this role, I've learned how to make decision-making pro decision processes objective and equitable. I've learned how to ensure town policies. Well, <laughs> well, uh, Thank you very much again for this opportunity. Um, and uh, I hope you will vote for me uh, for Commissioner of Trust Funds. Thank you. For Board of Library Trustees, three-year positions for two, Janice Barry, Democratic Caucus nominee. Good evening. My name is Janice Barry, uh, and I'm running for the Library Board of Trustees. I am an avid reader and regular patron of the library. I believe the library is the cornerstone of our community, and I feel called to serve after 10 years of making Hopkinton my home with my husband, Mike, and now our two-year-old son, Nate. I've been a music educator for 11 years, teaching elementary, middle school, and high school students for the dover Sherburn Public Schools. As an educator, I understand the importance of public institutions in our communities. In my spare time, I'm an active member of the Hopkinton Running Club, Hopkinton Moms Group, and Faith Community Church. As a trustee, I would place special emphasis on governance, policy making, and strategic planning. I would work with the library director and board members to create and evaluate policies for building and material, material use to ensure that we protect and maintain our beautiful library. A new strategic plan will be published shortly, and I look forward to the opportunity to carry out its implementation <coughs> to increase and maintain foot traffic and to advocate for support from residents and elected officials. The tagline of the library is explore, discover, connect. If I have the opportunity to serve as a library trustee, I promise to help my fellow residents explore the many services available to them, discover and learn new things through reading, 
and connect with fellow neighbors in the beautiful library we are privileged to call our own. Please visit facebook.com slash Janice for Library and vote on May 20th. Thank you. Thank you. Susan Porter, candidate for re-election, Democratic Caucus nominee. Hi. Thank Hi. you to the Hi. Women's Club and HCAM for the opportunity to come here today. Um, I'm running for re-election uh, to the Library Board of Tr Trustees, where I'm currently the chair. Um, I'm a retired RN with a, uh, who graduated from Boston University and have always been passionate about libraries. My husband and I have been residents of Hopkinton for more than 43 years. And we, um, one of the first actions when we moved here was to get library cards. I raised my daughter in the Hopkinton Library, and luckily I had the opportunity for her to move back to town with her family. And now her daughter is a volunteer at the library also. Also came in fifth in the regional science fair at um, WPI, just uh, aside. <laughs> <laughs> when I retired, I was naturally drawn, drawn to the library as a volunteer, and then director Ronak Hussein encouraged me to run for the Board of Trustees. Um, uh, my tenure at the, on the board has been through exciting times for the library. I and, our, and the rest of the board have worked through with three wonderful directors during the build up to the town meeting vote, the planning, and finally the building of our beautiful new library. I've been involved in implementing two strategic plans for the library, multiple policy decisions, and administrative oversight of the library director. Um, we've been planning and hosting many events for the library, including hosting the grand opening in October of 2017. During my time on the board, we have been trying to lead the board in a new direction, which is more accessible. We have been participating actively in um, friends and foundation events and hosting events and educating ourselves. I'm committing to assisting the library remain relevant in an increasingly digital age, and I can't wait to see where our library goes as it grows and matures. I would appreciate your vote on May 20th. Thank you very much. Thank you. For Parks and Recreation Commission, a three-year position for uh, one person. Cynthia Estimer, Democratic Caucus nominee. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. Thank you to the Hopkinton's Women Club and to HCAM staff and volunteers. Thank you for hosting this important event. I came to Hopkinton 33 years ago and found my forever home. Um, I intend to stay for forever. Um, I was attracted all those years ago to the small town that we were. and. In particular, the lakes, the trails, the parks, the incredible natural resources that we have here. They're very special and near and dear to my heart. Now, I did not have any children of my own. However, my career was spent raising, I lost count after 1,200, but children in an after-school program in the city of Newton. And during uh, that career, I came to really understand what the needs of young children were, the programming, the diversity of interests. Not everyone needs to play on a soccer field. Some need arts, some need manners and things like that. <laughs> um, so I learned so much about the programming needs of children and really found that my career was well spent there. As a leader in the program, though, I was responsible for working with the City of Newton's Planning and Development, the Parks and Recreation Department, uh, Buildings and Maintenance, Police and Fire, and of course, the two mayors over my 25 years there. Because of my career, I think that I now have the time and the ability to serve Hopkinton and this is my way, I'd like to give back. Consider a vote for me on May 20th. Thank you. Thank you. Peter Edwards, nomination papers. Good evening, uh, and thank you to the Hopkinton Women's Club for holding this very informative event. Uh, my name is Peter Edwards, and I am excited to be running for Parks and Rec. Uh, let me begin by saying I'm very blessed to have this opportunity to participate in local government after being born, raised, and educated in this great town. My experience as a kid growing up was pretty special. Special to me in that I always felt that I lived in the center of the universe. 
a place where I experienced the importance of family, friends, and community. At an early age, I noticed a trend of active participation in the community throughout my family on many different levels, whether it was my Grandma Nealon's tenure at the town, as the town clerk to my Uncle Bobby Edwards running the donut truck at the youth soccer fields. Participation was important. After graduating from Hopkinton High School in 1999, I went on to receive my bachelor's degree in marketing from Salve Regina University. And in 2005, my cousin Joe and I started Hayden Row Properties right here in Hopkinton. Today, I live here with my wife, Christine, and our three daughters, Emily, five, Abby, three, and Olivia, three and a half, three and a half months. <clears throat> my goal as a parent is to provide my girls with a similar experience that I enjoyed through family, friends, and community participation. <clears throat> that is why I've chosen to run. Uh, Parks and Rec to me is about experiences. By providing the community with space, facilities, and programs, it gives the townspeople the opportunity to create memorable experiences. Whether it be your first soccer game, a great swim at Sydney Beach, or maybe a big win on the cricket field. Those are all experiences that Parks and Rec helped to create and become the Hopkinton, your Hopkinton experience. My goal, if elected, is to use both my local and professional knowledge to help enhance and maintain the use of our assets in a responsible way to continue providing memorable experiences for all the people of Hopkinton. Thank you. Thank you. For planning board, a five-year position for one, Gary Trendle, candidate for re-election, nomination papers. Thanks, Kathy, and uh, thanks to the Women's Club as well as HCAM for, for hosting the event. Um, again, my name is Gary Trendle, and I'm running for re-election to the five-year planning board seat. As a Hopkinton resident for almost 12 years, I've seen our town face many challenges, most recently being the explosive growth that concerns many of us. I don't think there's a simple solution but I do believe that through creativity and a progressive mindset, we can make the best of the situation, we, of the situation we've all been dealt. I've served on the planning board for almost one year uh, and have gained a great appreciation for the complexities associated with it. I've distinguished my service on the board with an open ear, an appreciation for what's in the best interest of our community, uh, and an unbiased mindset. I grew up with a strong interest in urban planning and architecture and considered studying it in college, but I opted for a more traditional civil engineering degree. Then in business school, I worked for a, a small consultancy that advocated for something called new urbanism, which really sparked my interest in new ways of building community. To me, good planning is an art. It combines a willingness to engage with the community, a strong technical background, a forward-looking vision, and a deep appreciation for what builds strong, sustainable communities. In addition to my planning board experience, I've also served on the CP, I also serve on the CPC, and I've been previously been a member of the Upper Charles Trails Committee. I'm very active with my three daughters, having coached soccer, basketball, and softball, and previously being an age group coordinator for youth soccer. Uh, I work at Boston Scientific and Enterprise Marketing Strategy, and in my spare time, I enjoy working on our house and riding on my bicycle through Hopkinton. So thanks for your engagement in our community, and I greatly appreciate your support for my candidacy. Thank you. The planning board, Two-year position for one, Robert Benson, nomination papers. Hi, my name is Robert Benson. I'm a candidate for the planning board two-year term. I want to start by thanking the Hopman Women's Club, uh, HCAM, the other candidates, the attendees, and the viewers at home for making this a terrific evening, helping educate the, the residents of town on who they can vote for. Um, I've lived in Hopkinton most of my life. My parents moved here when I was 11 years old. <coughs> And I've lived in town since then, besides going away to college for four years. So in total, I've been in town 33 years and plan on staying uh, as, long as, as far as I can see into the future. Um, my parents still live in the house I grew up in. And I've lived with my, my wife in our current home where we're raising our two twin eight-year-old boys for 15 years. Growing up in town, I heard consistently from my dad about issues and opinions on town-related land use, um, gov uh, government lot sizes, lot fr uh, frontage, uh, commercial properties, and the impact they would have on the town. And I heard why Hopkins was a great place to live because of all these bylaws and how the town was structured, and, and it was all a great place to live. In recent years, um, my dad, like many others, some of that positive has turned more into concern 
And that's what basically was the straw that broke the camel back. And that concern from people that talked to me caused me to run for planning board and help uh, step up and do something to be the voice of those people that have concern. Um, with that being said, I think Hopkinton is a great place to live. I want to bring a balanced, educated, and unbiased view to the planning board. I want to work with the other eight members of the planning board uh, to, and be part of a board that helps make um, meetings productive, votes productive, and brings issues forward that can better the town. So everyone in town cares about land use issues and how they can affect property values. The school system, strain on town departments, and what happens in, in people's own backyards is very important to all of us. I want to do my part to help shape the future of Hopkinton. Thank, I appreciate your consideration, and thank you. Vote for me on May 20th. Thank you. For planning board, the two-year position, for one, Michael McNamara, nomination papers. All right. Hi, everyone. So why am I running? Well, currently I'm on the library trustees, and my term ends coming up. But I, did, I was on the library trustees for three terms, and I was there when the library, the old library, and now, obviously, the new library. And to be honest, you know, doing it after three terms, I'm, I'm ready for something else. And I've always been intrigued with the planning board and the issues are, that the planning board wrestles with. And, you know, building and all the development is such a hot topic. So I think I thought I learned a lot in the planning board. I loved it. I worked with Susan. It was awesome. But I'm, I'm just ready for a change. I think I can bring a fresh perspective. And you know, I've been in town since 97. I got two kids. My son went through the school system. He's in college now. He's actually in the Canary Islands right now doing the study abroad. And my daughter's a senior at, at Hoppington High. But I've been volunteering in town since 2001. So when my kids were young, I coached soccer, basketball, baseball, softball. And then I'm also uh, at uh, St. John's Church here in Hoppington. I've been on their parish council for many years. And I also, when my kids were in ninth and 10th grade, I taught religious ed. And then uh, two of the other volunteer things I've been involved with for a long time. One is the uh, Mustard Seed, which is a food pantry in Worcester, which is originally where I'm from. And that's actually through the St. John's Church, but also with the Worcester County Food Bank. I, I volunteer a lot. So I just think I can you know, bring, a, bring a fresh perspective. I'm looking to do something different and ask for your vote. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, planning board, a one-year position for one. Patrick Atwell, Democratic Caucus nominee. Uh, first up, I'd like to thank the Women's Club for hosting this wonderful event, as well as HKM. Uh, my name is Patrick Atwell, and I'm running for the one-year seat for planning board. I've been a resident of Hopkinton since 2012. My wife and I have four wonderful children. Two of them are still in the uh, school system. Connor's in the Hopkins, and Lily is a sophomore. So that's fun times. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, my wife and I really enjoy the small town culture that Hopkinton has to offer, and obviously the wonderful school systems that are here. That's why we keep our kids here in the school system. Uh, during this time living here, I've seen this town grow at a rapid pace, where one starts to wonder, are we growing too fast, and are we putting a strain on our public services, fire, police, DPW? Uh, the planning board plays an important role in ensuring that we as residents can help maintain and grow the town in an orderly way. We must preserve the charm and character of our town, in which is what attracted so many of us to come live here. I believe in working together as a team. In doing so, I will work with the board in shaping our town for the future, as well as preserving the history and the culture we all grown to love. I want to give back to this town. So currently, I serve on the Veterans Celebration Committee. Uh, to further my education for the planning board, I've attended the Citizens Planner Training Conference this past March. Uh, professionally, I'm finishing up my Juris Doctorate. I'll be graduating uh, this June, and I'm a certified negotiation and uh, mediator. My experience and understanding in applying the law, I feel, will be a great addition to the planning board. So I respectfully ask for your vote on May 20th. Thank you. Thank you. For school committee, a three-year position. For one, Nancy Richards Kavanaugh, candidate for re-election, nomination papers. Thank you, and thank you to the Women's Club, and thank you to HCAM for hosting this event. I think this event, uh, and I know there are a lot of events that are really great in town, but I particularly appreciate this, the opportunity to highlight our candidates and to have our community show how invested we all are in being here and making it be the community that it is and continue uh, 
as we go forward. So thank you to everybody who's participating and watching and going to ask questions later on. I came here three years ago uh, when I was first running, and what I had said then is that we were on the cusp of change, and here we are three years later, and the change has come uh, in the schools for sure. We had, last year, we were looking ahead, and NESDEC had projected that we would have 50 new students in this school year. By September, we had almost 200 new students, and the challenges that that brings in looking at how we budget is it, it, it can be challenging, and it will probably continue to be challenging in the near future anyway. And one of the things that is important to me is maintaining our excellent schools and also maintaining the fiduciary responsibility that we hold to this town. In looking at the needs of all of our learners uh, at every level and in every different manifestation they have of, of the way kids are, different abilities and whatnot. So it's important to me uh, that as a community to hear what everybody has to say and to, to listen to the concerns and to make sure that the school committee is accessible to everybody. Uh, because our community is growing and we do have different people coming in that have not been here and to make them feel welcome and to feel like the schools are what they moved here for in many times. So it's important to me to maintain the schools that people have moved here and stayed here for. So in terms of my background, I am a social worker, a mental health emergency services clinician. I've lived in town for 21 years and I have four kids. One of them has graduated already and off in college. I have one who's about to graduate, and then I have a, an eighth grader and a third grader. So I am, will continue to be invested in the schools for a number of years to come. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, and enjoy the program. Thank you. Thank you. Let us now give a round of applause for all the candidates. <laughs> and now it's time for the second portion of our program, the question and answer segment. For members of the studio audience who want to ask a question, please step up to the microphone, state your name, your address, and your question. If you prefer to have a written and submit a written question for me to ask, there are no cards available on the table in the back of the room. In addition, viewers at home, you can ask questions of the candidate by dialing the direct call line number displayed on your screen or by sending an email to live at hcam.tv. Please remember that if new people are waiting to ask a question, there'll be a limit of one query per person. Responses from candidates should keep to the maximum of two minutes. And if a question is posed to a specific candidate, I'll offer the response time to all the other candidates for that office as well. And lastly, the privilege of being the first person in a group to answer will begin alphabetically and then rotate as subsequent questions are asked. So we're ready for the first question. Audience? Hi. Hi, my name's John Cardillo. I live at 84 Winter Street. Uh, I think this question's really for the selectmen. I know that the town has grown. I've been here for 25 years. Um, and I have two children that have graduated um, from the Hopkinton school system, and they've both done very, very well, very proud of that. But what are we doing for our elderly? Uh, how are we uh, gonna, the tax rate has gone through the roof. What can we do for our aging um, <laughs> population here in Hopkinton? Thank you. Mayor Joe Lafrenia, would you like to uh, sure. be the first one to answer that? And as, as an assessor, I can answer that. Um, for one thing, I am also on the uh, tax relief committee in town, and which does give relief to people who come and need it for elderly and tax purposes. We also have a great number of exemptions in town, and I'd like to actually make an announcement tonight that the applications for the means-tested senior exemption are now available from the assessor's office. Uh, that has to be returned along with the circuit breaker portion of the state income tax return. And it, you may or may not qualify, but it's more than the usual senior exemption. Uh, we have senior exemptions, we have veterans exemptions, we have blind exemptions, uh, which are, are done with state criteria uh, and uh, people, the applications are available in the assessor's office. 
all the time. And uh, But this new one is very interesting. And so far, nobody's taken out an application. And I really think that uh, it's worth exploring on your part. And uh, seniors are being looked at very closely. And we now have a new Veterans Brave Act, a uh, number of them that are coming out. Uh, at this town meeting, you'll see them. You'll see them at, at the town meeting articles, and the assessors will be administering those as as we go along. Uh, I really, I really think we're trying to do things for seniors, and I think we can do a better job. It's just finding ways to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Chahito Manon. Thank you, Kathy, and a great question. I think, uh, first of all, we all empathize with our uh, great citizens who built this town and now being priced out of the very place that they built. So we gotta do something. And I, I, I hear Mary Jo and excellent uh, elaboration of the process, but absolutely it's not enough is what we are hearing from, all of, um, from various uh, areas of the town. And it sounded complicated too. So we gotta simplify, that's number one. And second is, I get a sense, looking at the numbers from the budget committee and others, that we don't have enough funding there. So we gotta do something, especially when we are having a boom economy cycle, to enrich and uh, give more contribution to this fund so we can accommodate more and broaden the criteria. And again, simplify so um, the affected, real affected people can participate. And last but not the least, I think we gotta do something about our tax increase. And the way to handle it is getting new revenue so we can lower the burden on the residential taxes, which is 84% today. And we gotta put more oversight so we can manage our budgets um, with a uh, little more, I think, um, close attention. And what do I mean by that is, as I look into the budget, and we've done a lot of great things and a lot of great ideas and a lot of good things are happening, but at the same time, it feels like it's a lot more siloed um, issue by issue kind of activity, which is very much urgent and needed, but we need to connect the dots and make sure we have a comprehensive plan so we can actually utilize the funds appropriately and make our taxes more reasonable, uh, if not slowing down um, and reverse if possible, that'd be ideal. But at least we know where we are going, where we are, our funds are coming from, and how we are prioritizing and putting it in the right places. I think without a comprehensive plan and connecting these dots, it's becoming difficult. So with all these things, I think we can we can check our keep a check on our taxes and help the elderly. Thank you. Thank you, Brendan Ted Stone. So, I think Mary Jo kind of summed it all up very specifically. <clears throat> uh, I don't think there's a person in the room that knows that better than Mary Jo. Uh, what I can tell you is one of the one of the um, arguments that I had gotten into as a selectman with our finance uh, our, our assessors and our finance people. Nobody cares that our tax rate is $17.17 a thousand. And nobody cares that your house is valued at whatever. What they care about at the end of the year is what the check is that they're writing. So you can say that taxes are staying the same and we're getting all this new uh, debt into the town and we're, we're spending this and spending that we're, for $17.17 a thousand. And we're not changing. It sounds great. But when your appraise, your assessment comes in and you're up 20%, at the end of the year, your taxes go up 20%. So it sounds great that we keep our tax rate the same, but at the end of the year, it's about how much you're paying. So one of the, the seniors and the veterans are, are the two things that I kind of put as a priority, um, not just as a selectman, but in my life. Um, you know, I think these people that have lived in town forever deserve to live in town. Um, I took a lot of heat with my vote against the turf field in town. Uh, it wasn't because I, I didn't want to spend $25 a year for 10 years for my two young kids to utilize it for the next 15 years. Because you think of the seniors who are on a fixed income living at their home who can't swing $25 a year. It's kind of a big deal. So um, so there, I, I think there's many plans that we can do to, to, um, to work with the seniors and to make it so it is affordable for them. To me, in my heart, they're, they're the most important people in the town, the seniors and the veterans. So thank you. Claire Wright. Going last, they hit on all the great topics, but um, at the risk of repeating some of the things, certainly Mary Jo touched on a number of our programs that we have and continue to develop for senior relief. 
um, as well as our tax relief fund. And one of the things that I brought up recently was having all that information in one easy area where seniors could access that. And that has just recently happened where both in the, in the um, tax office, and I believe it will be in the senior center as well, um, is one document that will show all the various areas where tax relief may be sought along with assistance at the senior center for seniors to, to navigate that. Um, of course, we have a variety of services since we've built our new senior center. Those services continue to grow. The Board of Health offers senior services as well. There are services through the library, a uh, wonderful um, memory time cafe for seniors. So we do have a variety of services to make sure that although we have much of a focus on our young population, that we do serve our seniors as well. But down to the dollars and cents in the budget process, this is something that is continually on our minds. And um, it has been a focus of the <coughs> Board of Selectmen in every budget discussion that, as Mr. Tedstone said, your house is appreciated. That's great when you sell it. But if you've been there for 30 or 40 years, you're not going to realize that on an everyday basis. So um, I would contend about uh, a comment that was just made about uh, the funds not being carefully allocated or something to that effect. I can assure you that we have worked our budget process every meeting until the very end to try and make sure that we land, ran, ran a lean government that tried to respect all our citizens and serve all our citizens well. Thank you. Uh, this question came in an email. Um, actually, why don't you go first yeah, since you're here patiently thank waiting. You. Thank you, thank you. Can you start uh, with your name and address? Yes, I'm Leslie Fakiri and I live at 57 Greenwood Road. And this question is a follow-on and it's for Brendan and Claire. Um, and, and please, it's not a gotcha question. It's a, it's a question that, you know, you already sit on the Board of Selectmen. And since I have come to town also uh, now for 20 years, we have said there's the issue that our seniors haven't been able to, to stay in town. They can't afford to stay in town. So my question to you, since you're already on the Board, is what obstacles have you run into being on the Board of Selectmen that has prohibited you from kind of thinking out of the box or um, being able to take up something that's so different? Because I, I, I'm, there may be some um, law, legal aspects and things that we can't do. Like on the Board of Assessors, we, we don't get to make random decisions. We are very much following the Department of Revenue. So, so you know, what are some of the things that you might have wanted to do but you couldn't do because you're running into obstacles in the way we're structured or the way the board is structured, et cetera. So, Claire, right, please. Okay, okay sure. Um, we are certainly always on the lookout and in, in support of any legislation or bylaw changes that can be made to provide tax assistance wherever we can to our seniors. But I think one of the challenges, and it not only addresses seniors, but all aspects of our government, is our growth causes demands on our budget. And we have had our budget supported by some of our new growth, but we have a growing youth population. We have rising costs in every single one of our departments. And anyone knows that at the end of the day, your income has to equal your expenses. And what we don't want to do is try to raise those tax rates. Um, that is first and foremost. And so we try to take a very lean approach. Um, but I, you know, it doesn't sound like a very imaginative, out of the box answer to tell you that when you start looking at the budget process every year, the challenge of our rising costs and our growth is a huge impediment to sometimes keeping some of those rates where we wish they would be. Next. So <clears throat> uh, one of the programs that I looked into, uh, Sudbury has a program for almost, it's, it's similar to like a dual tax rate for seniors versus uh, the rest of the town. And obviously we're, we don't have a dual tax rate, 
but it, 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 it's a program that I've been looking into. I worked a little bit with Mike Shepard, um, and I've submitted it to Norman to have him look at it. And it's a way to kind of make it so, like I, I use the turf field as an example. Uh, and I'm not saying that seniors don't use the turf field. Maybe they go out and walk around. I don't know. <laughs> they could. I, I hope they do. Um, but, you know, there, there's a lot of things in town. The Marathon School, um, the new high school, um, everything that we've paid for, the seniors don't necessarily get a chance to use all of that. And it's hard for me to go to the Spoon on a Saturday morning and look at all my friends and their parents that I've been going to the Spoon with for 40 years, 35 years, I guess, um, and get hit with all these questions. As a board, we only can do so much. We can all have the, the, the best ideas and the greatest intentions, but we're legally bound. We can only do so much. So. Thank you. Our next question is from the audience. Hi, Amanda Barker, Hook, 75 Grove Street. Um, this is for the um, candidates for planning board. Um, residential growth and the impact on town services and the budget is very complicated. Um, I'm wondering what do you think is an effective way to address residential growth and if you were heading up a strategic planning process what would your first step be? Thank you. Let's start with Robert Benson. The other candidates may come up. Um, so the best strategy to deal with residential growth. So the planning board like like uh, uh, any um, board is, well, especially the planning board, it's, it's governed by zoning bylaws. So there's, there's a certain amount the planning board can do, and it's consisted of nine members that vote on, on certain um, things that come before them. Um, so I think each situation is unique. And to curb residential growth, some of the basically zoning bylaws that have changed over, over time, when my parents moved to Hopkins in 1986, the rules to build a house in certain zones in town was dramatically different. Those rules have lessened over the years to bring in tax revenue, and some of those things would be very difficult to reverse. But in hindsight, there's the side effect of residential growth and the impact on affordable housing and how those impact developments. And like right now, uh, the town has a surplus of affordable housing units, um, but we. If there's a balance to keep stay above the state mandated limit, but there's also a desire not to get too high because of all the services the town provides. So the impact on residential growth and town services is a real issue, and the the planning board needs to be more forward thinking as opposed to reactionary. Like a certain part of the planning board is completely reactionary. A project comes in front of the planning board, they need to deal with it, and that's just a matter of fact. But there needs to be a certain amount of time to plan ahead. Uh, secondly, heading up a strategic like master plan or strategic plan of the town. I think the best input to that is all of the residents of town. Like I've been to the last few planning board meetings and since I was interested in running, I've been. And a lot of it is seems there's not enough input from the community at large. Like the planning board meetings, there'll be like six people that will attend. The, the project at 76 Main Street gets a lot of attention. Um, and it, there'll be an influx, but it's not, like, I don't know where the voices are coming from. Like, I know I have a lot of constituents in town that I can talk to and get input, and that's what I think I can bring to a strategic plan. Thank you. Michael McNamara? Sure. So on the residential growth, actually, not a bad problem to have, right? I mean, if it, there's a lot of towns wish they were growing and house prices were going up, but it's a hot issue to tackle. And maybe, you know, I don't know all the zonings in and outs, but changing lot sizes to be larger lots, pushing more of the commercial um, it's a you know it's a it's a problem a lot of towns deal with actually uh, the town where we used to live had that same same problem they tried increasing lot sizes and, and pushing more on the on the commercial side but to answer your question about like strategic planning honestly I, I think people you know to Robert's point you know people can't be on the same board for four or five terms it needs to get fresh fresh blood in and it's part of the reason why I'm running, why I said I was in the library trustees for three years. Now I'm looking to do something different. I just think people need to get involved, and different people need to get involved. And, and I just think we could all can bring different ideas. We all come from different, different backgrounds. So from a strategic planning point of view, I think it's just involving different people and different people getting on the planning board and zoning board. You know, when, when, so we're always refreshing. 
and getting fresh, fresh blood and new ideas. Thank you. Uh, Patrick Atwell. Well, strategically, I sort of disagree. Uh, you need those experienced people on the planning board to help out some of the newer members that are coming out. So you don't want to always keep switching people out because, you know, under my understanding, it takes a while to learn the planning board. You don't just come in in a year and say, I can do this real quick. But strategically, I think uh, this town needs to up its commercial uh, growth. Uh, residents has had a, a sudden boom. I know that's the hot topic of the uh, moratorium that's out there. Um, the master plan. I think if we go back to the master plan, take a look at it, and work off of that, update it if we need to, I think that's one strategic plan you can use, as well as what Rob said earlier, it's the citizens of this town. You know, if I don't hear from you, or the board doesn't hear from you, we don't know what's going on. There's always chatter in the background of, you know, people complaining and, and all that, but if you don't voice your opinion at these meetings, we have no idea what everyone's looking for. You know, it's not my board, it's our board. And I can push the agenda if I get some feedback on what's going on. So I think more citizens get involved, going back to the master plan, you know, follow that a little bit more, tighten it up. And I think that's how you can get the residential under control. Thank you. Gary Trendle. Um <clears throat> Thanks, Dan. I think it's a great question. And, and um, candidly, I think as, a, as the incumbent that's up here, I can share some of the things that, that, that we've been talking about as a board. Um, and, and really, there's, there's two things that we focused on. Uh, the first is that earlier this year, we've restructured how the Zoning Advisory Committee functions. Uh, in the past, it was really a, a cyclical, um, you know, it was a, a relatively short period of time. Um, and so what we realized is that we didn't have enough um, planning that was going into that. We felt it was very reactive because it was something that was really done and, and started in the fall in preparation for town meeting. And then once town meeting was over, uh, that wrapped up. So we've actually restructured that committee um, to uh, have uh, longer term seats and, and make that a year round responsibility so that the zoning advisory committee, which really advises our bylaws, which dictate how the planning board makes decisions, um, has the time to put in uh, to think about these more complex issues. Uh, and then the second piece, actually, just on uh, our planning board meeting on Monday, um, is we're recommending that we move forward with a, uh, a, a subcommittee uh, specifically intended to address this, this topic of, of growth. Um, I can't tell you I have the answers. It's complicated, um, and there, there really isn't an easy solution. Um, I, I don't think this is something that we just, you know, um, just go increase lot sizes or, um, you know, there, there's, there's complexities associated with, um, with, with, uh, with limiting residential, residential uh, permits. That might be the right option, but we need to understand those trade-offs when we do so. Um, so i just throw one other idea out there, and I think this relates back to the seniors as well, is that I think one of the challenges that we have is that people live here, their kids graduate, and then, they, and then they move someplace else. And I've always been a big believer that if there are some ways that we can make this a more desirable place for our seniors or for people that don't have kids to live here, then we can actually control or we can actually limit some of those things that are causing our, uh, that, are, that, are, that are resulting in our growth and, and the, the tax rates and other challenges that we've had. So, thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from the audience. Um, thank you. I'm Amy Groves from Chu College Street, and I have a question for the selectmen candidates. Um, as we heard earlier tonight, um, the um, Hopkinton Women's Club was founded in 1920. It's the same year that women earned the right to vote. They also earned the right to serve, including on the Hopkinton Board of Selectmen. That's our highest executive body in this town. And as we approach the centennial of that historic event, we find that we're still referring to it as the Hopkinton Board of Select Men. Um, so we have two articles, as it happens, on the warrant that propose to get the ball rolling to change that and to upgrade the language, update the language to Hopkinton Select Board. Would you be in favor of that? Would you have any problem with that? And why? Thank you. Mary Jo Lafrenia. Well, I. I don't care what you call me, as long as I'm allowed to do the job. <laughs> however, <laughs> however, I do understand that uh, women are moving forward today, and that the word selectman came from a time when communities were very small and they needed to pick a government, and women weren't allowed to vote, they weren't allowed to do much of anything, so they selected certain men to run that particular 
a town or city or whatever it was, and they were called the selectmen. And now we have two sexes involved in everything, and I, for one, don't have a problem with updating the name to select board, and for not just for myself, but for the girls that are going to come after me, all the women that are going to come after us in, in the future, maybe they won't want to be select men. Maybe they would want to run for the select board. So it's fine with me either way. But I do, I do like the idea. Thank you. Tahito Manon. Oh, sure. Uh, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think I would definitely vote for it. And for the following reasons. I think we, we are a 300-year-old town, and I'm very proud of it but we have moved and progressed in 300 years. So what we had as a name 300 years ago, I think it's time to change. And obviously, I have a daughter, and I believe that uh, women in leadership is, is uh, something to be proud of, and we are all proud of and recognize it within the names. And that's just the right thing to do. And also, I think my grammar teacher would say it's grammatically wrong to call a woman a man. So, <laughs> so combining all these, I would absolutely support it. Thank, Thank you. you. Brendan Tedstall. So I've done a little research on, on the term selectman. Uh, the term selectman isn't derived from selected man. It's derived from selected human. It had nothing to do with gender. So in our town, we've had 11 female selectmen. Nine are alive still. I've spoken to eight. I didn't talk to Muriel because I kind of knew her point of view. <laughs> eight of those eight were in favor of keeping it selectmen. They weren't opposed. They weren't offended. It has nothing to do with the sex of a person. It's a selected human. I don't, as Mary Jo said, I don't care what you call me. We're in tough times right now, financially, for the town. Teachers are arguing if they can use Crayola crayons or if we have to buy them generic crayons. I don't think the town should spend one penny of its resources to change the name from selectman to select board. I'm not opposed to it. I get called a lot of things a lot of times every day. Selectman, select board, I don't care. My thought is I'm a big fan of tradition. I like the term selectman. I ran for selectman. And I think even if it does get passed at town meeting and, and the ballot this year, it can't go until the next charter, which is nine years from now. So I'll be a memory by then, uh, as had served as selectman. So I guess I would say I'm not in favor of changing it, and it has nothing to do with uh, gender. It has everything to do with finance. Thank you. Claire Wright. I agree with the idea that I don't really care what you call me. Uh, this is not the hill I'm going to die on, but I, I don't really support this. Um, to some extent, I've kind of been proud to be a selectman, but to Mr. Ted Stone's point, in the English language, there is the generic term, mankind. Um, when Neil Armstrong said, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, he wasn't leaving me out. And I feel that... Um, frankly, just from the sound on my ears, I think it's awkward. I think it's contorted. I think there is way too much focus on small matters that turn into someone else being offended if we say the wrong thing. As Mr. Tedstone said, we have much bigger things to address in this town. I love history. I love tradition. Um, I understand the derivation of this word. And we have a long history of women who have stepped up. Not a one have been afraid. If you're frightened off by a title, you don't have the stuff it takes to serve in one of these boards because you need to have a thick skin. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm entitled to my opinion, and that's my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Next, from the audience. Thank you. And thank you to the Women's Club. I'm Mary Jo Andrikan, to College Street. Uh, this question, I suppose, is mostly for the select, select board, selectmen candidates, <laughs> but any, anybody else who wishes to weigh in. What will you do to promote a unified Hopkinton? 
especially in light of the disturbing rise in racist and anti-immigrant incidents in this country in the last couple of years. Thank you. We'll start with Claire Wright. <laughs> Our town's, sure, our, our town has changed tremendously in recent years. Um, we've got a variety of new populations. Um, each one is bringing great diversity, great talents. Uh, we have new members of our boards. We have new members running for our boards. Um, I just recently attended the uh, uh, it was the Chinese New Year celebration for our Asian community uh, of, of hundreds of, of of our new Hopkinton residents. Um, they all love being in this town. They have not spoken to that issue. Um, I, I feel that we are very blessed to live, regardless of what others may feel about the society at large, Hopkinton has continued to demonstrate itself as a fair, open, honest, welcoming community. I think that's what's attracted people here. It's what I love here. And I can say it's not something that I have felt in this town. I felt quite the opposite, a spirit of welcoming and support and a place for all. And I think that's why I believe in Hoffington. I want to continue to serve. And that's why I think I've, what I've heard from other candidates, there's a quality in this town that's extremely special especially in the times we live in. Thank you. Brendan Tedstone. Yeah, so I can't speak for Chicago. I can't speak for the South. I can't speak for wherever else all this, the racism and anti-Semitism and all this other stuff goes on. I live in Hopkinton. I serve in Hopkinton. I was born in Hopkinton. That's kind of my slogan <laughs> this year in the 392 signs you've seen out there. Um, so, I, so I've been in Hopkinton. I've, I've been in Hopkinton where it was dirt roads and uh, Bill's Pizza was Brown and Smith's and it was a dirt road and you angle parked and you went in for a coffee and, and you got your chewing tobacco there. Um, <clears throat> there was no anything to do with racism back then because it was strictly just white people. <laughs> That's it. And you look at it now, and I, I sat at uh, Kenya Day just the other day with my son and the rest of the select men. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> so I have selectman guilt now. Um, Good. So we looked out, and, and one of the other selectmen and I sat there, and we, we said, look at the diversity in our third grade, uh, second and third grade population at Elmwood School. It was as diverse as it gets. Hopkins was just voted safest town in the, in the country. I don't see racism, anti-Semitism, <laughs> Um, homophobes, xenophobes, genophobes, any type of phobes. I think everybody welcomes everybody. And if they didn't, I think they would be ostracized and identified. And uh, I don't know anyone that would tolerate it. I certainly would not. Thank you. Uh, uh, actually, Shahil. Uh, Shahid al Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you can also call me Manan. That's probably easy. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you for that great question. I think um, looking at this great town and the uh, awesome citizens, uh, we have 70% or more graduates. Uh, I think it's a great town to set that example of what the future can look like, and the future is here. And the way we can do that is we have more and more in common, interest-wise or focus-wise, what we care about than our differences. And we want to focus on the unifying factors than some slogans for some uh, manipulation or some other interest some people try to divide us. I would focus on we being as a neighbor, we being one Hopkinton. We all care for our schools. We all care for our children. We all care for our turf fields, our senior citizens. We have so much in common, and we are all here because we love this town, and we want to do good things for this town. I think that is the basis for our principles, and that will move us forward, and that will set us as an example for the nation. And I agree. Now we are seeing a lot of diversity in the last few years that came with the growth, and we are embracing it, and we are also moving forward 
as a more diverse um, community, which is definitely heartening, and we'll continue to work on that. Again, we have a lot of good things and issues to work on, and using that as our unifying platform, that's how I would move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Jo Lafrenia? Well, I just, I'm all for inclusiveness, totally, because it brings on competition, it makes us work harder, it makes us get to know each other, and it opens the world up to our citizens. And that is a wonderful thing, it's, it's not a bad thing. And Hopkinton, I think, has always been a little bit forward in, in that way, because I'll tell you something that years ago, <laughs> when it was all white, <laughs> as Brendan <laughs> said, uh, Hopkinton was the first high school in the entire country to teach Russian as a second language. And that was at a time when we were in a Cold War situation and, and people were not happy with the Russians and yet Hoppington taught it to its students as a second language and I, and with no, no thought, just that it was a language out there and people need to know it and we need to communicate. And by being an inclusive town with all nationalities involved, we are going to be better educated, we are going to be uh, better at communicating, and uh, we are going to have more skills, and I, I just think that it's a wonderful thing. Thank you. And we have another question from the audience. Hi, hi everyone, good evening. I'm a resident of Legacy Farms North. I, I moved in one year back, and my kids are loving it. I mean, and that's, that's why, that's made me motivated to move to Hopkinton because the kids want to be more actively engaged in school and all the stuff. So my question to the board, uh, for all the ones, is we are facing a severe problem of safety issue for the kids who are traveling to the uh, school. The bus is, is almost a mile, everybody need to go. All the 100 houses need to pull in, in, a, in a couple of, I mean, 30, 40 cars and need to st drive through the one mile and then there's no parking slot available there, and we are parking 30, 40, 30 to 40 cars, and that's kind of, and then that road is not made public yet, but that's, that's and then the heavy vehicles going on that road, which is making the safety issues for the kid, for the 125 kids going in the morning. So can you, uh, somebody help us? We've been made numerous effort to reaching individual persons to everyone, like for the existing board and then builder, developer, everybody in the school. Can, can any of you can address that issue and can give us a good timelines when we, how do we need to solve this until, I mean, this was, this was told by, to me is like for the next four years until the last house has been sold, that road will not be made as public. So would you like to address your question to the school committee or selectmen or? For the selectmen, especially okay. to, to how do they address this issue. Okay. So this time we'll start with Mary Jo Lafrenia. Well, I'm not sure what the busing policy is, but I do believe that all the s school buses should go down all the streets in town as it does with all the other streets. Um, the only thing I want to say is, when I went to school, we had a two-mile bus limit, and I had to walk two miles exactly. <laughs> yeah, a lot of times it was uphill. Um, so times have changed, and for the safety of the children, I agree that we should provide busing. Whether or not the street is accepted yet by the town, we know it's going to be in the future, and it, the children are there, the cars are there, we, we need to do something about that situation. Shahid al yeah. uh, I would uh, I would answer that we do have to solve this problem. And there are a few technicalities that I'll go over a little bit, and then also the broader picture that I want to bring uh, to the plate. So the first is, I think this is a problem we have to solve because we have taxpaying citizens who are suffering, their kids are in danger, and um, in, in many ways it's a liability for town or moral obligation in many ways. And it can be done if we have all the key players in one table and have a more candid discussion about how we can share the responsibility and get it moving. I think that would be the first step. And given the opportunity, I would definitely approach it that way. Because a lot of times, and I've asked this um, because I have friends who are suffering, that the biggest problem is they don't get everyone in the same table. 
So it's kind of siloed thinking, and it's not everyone's, like, not, in, not exactly my problem. And I'm not blaming anyone. I know everyone's busy, and there's so many other priority things in many ways. But this is a priority in my view. So that's one. And the second, it also actually exposes us um, the challenges of the bigger picture, which is when we plan a large development like Legacy Farm, and we got a lot of good benefit out of it, but have we thought out all the details? And I know it was the first time, and we have a lot of learning, but I would promote that we do a lessons learned and build a framework that when we go for a development like this, how do we accommodate the, how, how do we accommodate the busing? How do we accommodate the streets, the cleaning and the uh, snow and ice and all these logistics things? Not picking out the can that we'll figure it out when the residents are here and it's their problem. These are all, we are all together. These are our, um, our fellow citizens. So I definitely would promote that we develop a framework going forward that brings the vendors and the developers uh, more responsible and us also more responsible finding a solution from the get-go and plan it properly. Thank you. Thank you. Brendan Tedstone. Yeah, so regardless of what my feelings are on it, um, it's the transportation company. Those roads aren't accepted yet. The transportation company, the buses can't go down there. So it's, a, it's an insurance thing. It's a liability thing. It has nothing to do with the selectmen. It has nothing to do with the planning board. It's a legal thing. The, the transportation company can't go down there. So. Thank you. Uh, Claire Wright. So I've been aware of this problem for quite a long time, and I certainly recognize the concerns and recognize the extent of the problem. Um, I want people to know I personally have done what I could to try to get to the bottom of it. When I first heard about it, I think it was last fall, I was surprised. I spoke with the town manager. I spoke with the school committee. I spoke with the school business manager and the individual who hands, handles transportation. Um, my understanding was, as Mr. Tedstone has said, because this, the, t the road has not been accepted as a town road and will not be accepted as a town road until the development is complete because the construction vehicles will damage it and then you'd have to just pay to repair the damage, the policy of the bus company is not to service non-town roads. Usually this isn't a problem because the developments are not of the size that Legacy Farms is. Um, the problem that the school committee and the school business office has encountered, and this really is a problem to be directed to the schools. People think the selectmen can solve everything, and I, unfortunately we can't. Um, we have right now one bus company. When the bids for contracts have gone out, my understanding from the schools is there is one company that has replied. There's no one to compete. They call all the shots, and they have consistently refused. I would like to find a way. I think perhaps something might be worked out with the developer to provide some funding or perhaps that the road be brought up to standards and then cover the cost of whatever repairs would need to be made when the entire development is finished, if there's damage done by the construction vehicles. But I do want to make clear, it's not that your problem has been ignored. There are problems with the bus company and the schools have been working on it. And I wish I had a better answer for you, but that is the truth. We are at an impasse, and we're going to keep looking. Thank you. Uh, from the school committee, Nancy Richard Kavanaugh would like to respond to this question. So I have a lot of empathy for your situation. And I know a year ago, we had a presentation from some, a gentleman at Legacy Farms who came in and presented the pictures. And, and at the time, when it came before the school committee, I thought, oh, this is something it would be great to get in there and find a solution. So went through looking into why the bus company wouldn't do it. And, and as some people have said before, there is an issue with the bus company. Their insurance will not cover for the buses to go on the road. So it's that was one issue. So then I thought, well, let's try to see what else we can do, because this is not a situation I think any parent would want to see when you see the cars queued up down there. The problem is, even if we could get that even if we could get the funding to run a bus down, we cannot, as a school district, bring another bus down. So what I would be in favor of, and I have talked with the director of finance, who also did not have a solution, but would be trying to get the key players to the table and to talk about what can we do going forward, because it's, there's got to be something out there 
that we can solve it even if we can't run our bus company buses down there. So I do hear the problem. It, it definitely it, it concerns me as a parent and as a school committee member, but I do hope that we can maybe sit with a developer and some of our partners in the town to work on that. Thank you. Thank you. And one last question from the audience before we look uh, at our emails. From the Muriel Kramer, 39 North Street, thank you. Um, on the bus safety thing, it's a safety issue. I would just make the comment that looking at the town looking at uh, providing additional insurance for the bus company might be one way to go to solve it quickly. Nancy is shaking her head no. Um, uh, I have a question for any candidate that's interested. I want to give other people a chance to, to uh, stretch their legs, but certainly the selectmen, certainly the planning board, um, and certainly the school committee. Um, a lot of conversation about growth, and it's a challenging conversation. There's a push and a pull on every issue involved in it. Um, what I'm really keenly interested in as we embark on uh, an effort that is uh, intended to bring as many stakeholders as possible into the conversation and, and think about ways to plan uh, as opposed to react, um, what would be your three priority issues in the conversation going forward um, f on the issue of managing, dealing with growth in the town of Hopkinton and also managing the growth dollars so that we protect the citizens and we don't build in the humongous uh, budget deficits that very often happen in these boom, boom economies as the growth is going crazy. Who would you like to start? I don't, you know what, how about the planning board? Give, give the selectmen right. a moment to sit. <laughs> we'll give the selectmen a rest. All right, the planning board will start with Gary Trendell. All right, thanks, Muriel. For, <laughs> um, I, I, I heard a lot of different, I, there was a lot of different things there, but I think I'm just going to try and summarize, and I think, you know, three areas of focus that we can do, that we should be doing to help evaluate and, and, and control our growth. Is that fair? Okay. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, three things for me. The, the first is to make sure that we are looking, uh, that we're looking forward at some of those properties that have the, the potential for future development. And um, a lot of people have said there's not a lot of land left to develop in town, but there actually is. And I think there may be some ways that we can, um, that we can, um, Know, maybe we can protect that land, or we can we can do some things to to uh, to encourage that it, it maintains its 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 current use. Um, the second thing that I, I think is uh, I think that that uh, and I, I I applaud the citizens that put forth the the citizens' petitions um, to to look at uh, limiting growth even for a short period of time. I think that's a really important conversation that we have, and I think that we need to understand the trade offs associated with that. Uh, it might be the right option, it might not, but um, there are um, complications with it and there's, there's, there's trade-offs. And, and I just don't know if, if we're in a position to, to answer that question. Um, and then the third for me is, um, one of the things that I've found is that the, without getting into the really complicated planning board issue here, um, you know, we do have um, open space subdivision law that, that or, or bylaws that actually um, encourage some preservation of land. Um, but I, I don't know if the difference between that and a traditional subdevelopment are big enough to really um, encourage the type of growth that we want. And so to me, I, I think it's worth considering uh, potentially, uh, in some zones, increasing the, the lot requirements for new homes. Um, and that doesn't mean that, that's, um, that you can't build a home on, on the smaller parcel of land, but you'd have to do so in that, um, in that open space format that, that we really want to encourage. Thank you. Uh, Michael McNamara. Sure, so I'm going to go off a little bit of a tangent, but it addresses growth. So I live in a development, 30 homes, eight of which are affordable housing. I can tell you two of those homes for the last three years are empty. That is a crime. Something's broken in this town. So we talk about affordable housing and growth, and we, we can't even, so like we'll, we'll call up the town and we'll say, we've got this vacant home. It's supposed to go to another Hoppington resident. The town says, call the state. We call the state, the state says call the town. What the hell's up? So growth, something's friggin' broken. That's why I'm running. No, but, uh, but no, honestly though, um, but honestly, uh, so seriously though, something is, something's broken. That's a crime. There are two homes going into disrepair that should be for Hoppington residents 
who you know grew up in town and just starting their career, and they're, they're vacant. No one, and the town's pointing at the state. The state's pointing at the town. So I, I, I don't know how to a, a address that, but there's a lot of smart people, and you know, before we start talking about building all these other homes, let's let's fix some of the it, problems we have right now with homes that are built that are going into disrepair. So sorry to go off on my soapbox. That has a, been a hot button for me. It's part of the reason why I'm actually I'm running as well for the planning board. Maybe I can help affect it. So, Thank you. Uh, Michael McNamara. That was just me. Oh, so, I mean, sorry. <laughs> I thought you had two more. You only gave us one. <laughs> All right, let's see. Uh, Patrick oh. Atwell. Uh, addressing the growth. Like I said earlier, it has to do with the, uh, let's take a look at that master plan. Let's pump the brakes a little bit. Let's, you know, gain control again of all these building permits we're issuing out there. And secondly, it's that uh, committee they talked about on the planning board the other night, that subcommittee, to do studies. There has to be studies done to actually fully understand because there are laws we have to, you know, watch out for. You're, you're walking a fine line dealing with people's property rights. So I think that's key that we fully understand the laws, you know, grab hold of that master plan, really study it, form that committee. And I think that's one way to address the growth that's happening in this town, to slow it down a little bit and just readjust. And uh, Robert Benson? So limiting growth is, there's multiple things to consider. It's not just do these three things, it's gonna uh, limit growth. Um, just attending the last couple of planning board meetings, there's an issue with part of Legacy Farms. There was age restriction on some of the uh, units for an elderly development. They can't make uh, age restricted and affordable housing in the same development. So what do you do? The state imposes, changes the law, the planning board is confronted with this, the property developer needs to do this. What do they do? Worrying about limiting the growth of town, they have an issue in front of them. Like, if you could rewind time, that whole project was originally not supposed to be built by Legacy as part of Legacy Farms. That was zoned as residential, uh, zoned as industrial. Then it got rezoned at town meeting to be affordable housing as uh, part of a plus 55 community. So looking forward, it's just making better decisions with, uh, and more informed decisions of what's going to happen as a result of decisions. So I think number one, just making informed decisions what, with the information kind of in front of you. Number two, you need like there needs to be an evaluation of some of the zoning bylaws and bringing those to town meeting and uh, putting forth proposals that can kind of protect some of the future growth. Uh, Gary mentioned this big. Uh, parcels of land that could still be developed. Um, just the town, uh, planning board the other day, uh, it was going to be, there was a uh, discussion about selling 27 acres to Eversource. So there's big parcels of land still available. It's not, the town is not built out. Don't let uh, anybody kid you with that. Um, so we've got to bring that to town meeting. Second, and lastly, there really needs to be some consideration for zoning uh, in certain areas of town and lot sizes. It's uh, a constant strain and the pressure of big business and influencing by developers to get things passed when they can fund millions of dollars to put campaigns forward to the town to saying these development projects will reduce tax burden when it's just not true. Uh, like the town needs to step up as a community to realize those effects. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, who is a uh, candidate for school committee? Um, Nancy Richards Kavanaugh. Thank you for that question, Muriel. It's a, a really important to a lot of different committees, school committee, I think particularly with the enrollment issues we've had. I think I want to say facilities twice if I can pick two, two for one, but I, I will list three. The facilities in the capacity of our facilities in the school is a huge concern. <clears throat> Excuse me. The, we just finished submitting to the Massachusetts School Building Authority a proposal for the Elmwood School uh, in looking to expand the Elmwood and also renovate at one time in the hope is that we will be called in. I have spoken with our state legislators who are also concerned about the issue uh, and working to try to move forward to get some state funding to help with that. The other issue that is likely going to come up would be the high school is nearing capacity and actually all of our schools except for Marathon are really nearing capacity. Elmwood, which we had hoped uh, with the preschool moving out to move into Marathon, would have more of a buffer. We have in what is our modular classroom there. Is, and modular is a portable classroom that we put in maybe 10 years ago. It is taken up by two groups of students that are being taught by two different teachers for uh, English language learners, so that there is just not a lot of space even there. So we are 
looking to move forward on a building project, but that's likely probably going to take, if Marathon is our experience, five years to bring it. So we're going to be looking probably at some modular classrooms across the district in different buildings. So working with the state legislators, working with the MSBA on building, working to find cost effective things like in some cases it would be modular classrooms uh, and working to reconfigure some of the space that we have that's not being used for instruction to be used as instructional space so that we can keep our class sizes manageable by spreading them out. So that's one and I know I'm running short on time. My other concern is staffing and making sure that we're able to main staff, maintain a, an appropriate staffing level to provide the excellence in our education without exploding our budget. So that's, we do have, you know, different ways we've tried to reconfigure things in our budget to keep it manageable. Thank you. Uh, Mary Jo Lafreniere, a candidate for select. I just, I just wanted to say that new growth and growing pains as we're experiencing them are very uh, stressful fiduciary wise and emotional wise for the people of the town. And I think that in the past, some people on boards are mixing up new growth that the assessors get with new growth for development. And what you have to do when you look at development is not just look at, at the new growth figure you're going to get once immediately built, because that's going to go away in a year or so. You have to look at what else it's going to cost us to bring in this development. How many children, what it's going to cost, what the streets are going to cost, what the snow plowing is going to cost. That is not new growth. New growth is only the additions or the building themselves. And in the next year, it's gone. It's not, it's not part of our new growth. So that, that figure and this other figure needs to be done. So I would support the planning board's idea, as I was at the meeting the other night, of doing a study. And we, in fact, we're late. We should have opened up the bylaws. We should have been looking at uh, the master plan as we went along. It should be looked at every single solitary year so that we can look and do predictions that are going to make a difference. And we're going to know what we're coming up against and not get hit with this 175 more kids than we thought we were going to get at the school at one time. And it can be done, but we need, we need to go back and open that master plan, and we need to open up the bylaws, and we, we may need to form a committee to look at them yearly as we grow, because that's, that's really what we're going to need in the future. Thank you. Shahid O'Manon. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mary Jo. Uh, and wonderful job in explaining such a complex uh, matter on growth. Uh, uh, certainly shows your experience and expertise in this area. I just wanted to add that uh, it's a complex equation, and there's no silver bullet per se. So we need to look at it from various angles. So I'll put some angles and then some thoughts how we can go about solving it. So one is, I think, Muriel, great question and very timely, as we all know. We certainly see that our town is one of the highest growing town in Massachusetts. And we see that impact on all the services. The school, I think Nancy explained it very well, we, are, we have seen 200 new students last year, and this year we are expecting the same or more. And we are seeing growth impacting our uh, fire. I, I was talking to the fire uh, chief, and certainly we see some jittery numbers on the response rate, which is also concerning. So it's obvious that we are seeing it from all angles, that we are going fast, and our services and others, and our budget is not able to keep up. Now here's the other angle. Because of the growth and the new development, we have two to three million dollar additional revenue on our budget. So stopping the growth suddenly would mean we have a hole of two, three million dollar in our budget, and how are we going to manage that? So all these equations need to be assessed, and what I would propose is, I think we talked about it, that how can we do a better assessment of the current scenario, <laughs> or services, or growth path, and project it, and help understand this equation and how we can solve it with the proper funding and all. And it's a little bit sad to see that we have a master plan that's 12 years old. So it's time that within this new context, we really go back to the basics and connect all the dots and strategically determine where we are going to be in three years, five years from now, and how we can go there. And we need all the ideas, great ideas. But I think it's a solvable problem. We may need to do some sacrifices. But I think there are a lot of good minds and a lot of great things in this town, and especially 
We are an affluent town, so it's a solvable problem. We need to get together and solve it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Claire Wright, a candidate for selectmen. I just want to make three quick points about the issue of what we can do to address growth. Uh, for one thing, I think it's important that we keep up through our inclusionary housing bylaw, we keep up with our affordable housing. Um, too often now the developers are allowed to just throw money into the pot instead of actually building the unit. And right now we have the luxury of having more affordable, or it's we're, we're over the 10%. But we could very easily fall under that if we don't keep up with the affordable housing and then make ourselves vulnerable again to the 40B comprehensive um, permit developments, which will bring in a lot of housing with very little oversight. So keeping up with our affordable housing is critical. Um, your planning board and your zoning advisory committee are the best tools the town has to craft zoning that is going to be well vetted, well thought out, legal and reasonable. And that is probably our, our as I said, it's, it's our best tool that we have. And I also want to mention our open space land use development um, bylaw, which has actually won awards in the state of Massachusetts. Um, to some extent, we're the vic victims of our own success that Hopton has become such a desirable community. But the open space development has saved hundreds and hundreds of acres of land from development, unlike what's happened in other communities. When you have large lots, you get five bedroom houses that are filled with children. And our open space land use development um, bylaw has allowed open space to be saved, smaller, denser housing that in the long run will limit the, the impact of school children and it will preserve the open space. What we don't want to lose is what's beautiful in our town with gobbling up the open space with large house lots again. We've been trying to avoid that and those are three tools that we want to, be, that we want to use. Thank you. Brendan Tedstone. All right. Candidate so, for Selectman. Yes, thank you. Um, so the three things. I would love to see the 300,000 square feet of retail and commercial space go back to legacy. I don't know how we let that go away before he had built out uh, or they had built out. Um, I would love to see South Street bursting at the seams with huge giant biotech um, corporation. And I would love to see someone come back into town like Dick Egan, who anytime we would go to the town meeting back in the days and we said they said no, Dick Egan would write a huge check and make sure that everything was all right so everything was great. Dick Egan has done a wonderful job, had done a wonderful job to propel our town to where it is now. It's up to us to manage it and maintain it. My three things are legacy farms, that uh, that 300,000 square, 300, square feet killed us. Uh, I'd like to see South Street bursting at the seams and if you know another Dick Egan that wants to move into town, I'll sell him my house real cheap. <laughs> so uh, Brendan Tedstone, um, this question's for you so you, you can remain of course it's uh, at the mic. Be. You were recently spotted in town wearing a Make Hopkinton Great Again hat, and your campaign sign says that you were born here, raised here, and serve here. Keeping all this in mind, what is your vision about making Hopkinton Great Again, and what steps will you take to make this happen? So whoever sent that in was three years late. Th make Hopkinton Great Again was three years ago. <laughs> the, one I, the hat I wear now says keep Hop keeping Hopkinton Great since 2016. <laughs> So, I'll send a reply to this. Right. No, don't bother. I think we're it's out of anonymous. Time. We're out of time. Um, so, I just my candidacy is is laden in common sense. I didn't go to MIT. Uh, I grew up in Hopkinton. I'm seven generations, like I've said. I love the town. I don't know anyone who loves it more. You'll never see me in green and white with orange because when I grew up, there was no orange in green and white. Um, so. I just do everything that I can within the, the boundaries of what we're allowed to do as selectmen to try to drop anchor a little bit, keep some history, keep some culture of, of the old Hopkinton uh, while not slowing down the, the, um, the, the growth and the, not, not the growth, that's a bad word, the, um, uh, the evolution of Hopkinton. Thank you. Should I this, stay? Yes. <laughs> this question is for uh, the candidates for Board of Selectmen. <laughs> So the question no is, to to the, uh... <laughs> the question is, have you recently read the town's master plan 
or re reviewed any strategic plan recently, and how would you relate it to our current budget plan and fiscal impacts? So this is for all of you, so two more may step up to the plate, and this time we're going to start with <coughs> Claire Wright. Well, I can't say that I've read the master plan recently. Um, I know I participated in the revision a few years back. Um, and, and I think that we all right now are grappling with finding a new vision for the town in that we've had growth that has come in in an unexpected way at a level that we have not anticipated. Um, and we're, and we're trying to find the best solutions to that. I think in the long run, we'll be fine. I think the schools are planning for it. I think much of our new growth that's come in, especially through Legacy Farms, in the long run, will portend very well for the town if we can get through this, this bubble of growth that is more than we anticipated. Um, the homes in Legacy are smaller homes, two and three bedrooms. These are the homes for people who will stay in Hopkinton. They won't have the five-bedroom house that when the kids leave, they'll leave too. These are the homes where people will age in place and become consistent, committed members of our community. So um, it's a learning process. I don't have the answers right now. We're feeling our way. It's taken all of us somewhat by surprise. Our friends on the school committee are, can probably speak most to that. But I think in the long run, Hopkinton will continue to be a wonderful place to live, and I think our future is bright. Thank you. Brendan Tedstone. So same as Claire, I haven't read the, the master plan in the last six, eight months, 10, 10 months maybe, but uh, obviously part of our job is keeping up with it and, and kind of um, maintaining the, the policies and procedures of how the town runs. Um, so, like Claire said about people aging in place, right now, where Hopkinton is in a, um, we've got to weather the storm right now of all this growth and, and the schools are bursting at the seams and we don't have the programs and we, so we need to kind of weather the storm here and one, one of the ways to kind of change the town, if people aren't happy with the way that the town runs, it's very unique that, that you know, we have town meetings. And when we, have, when we fight to get a quorum on some issues with 16, 17,000 people in town, and we don't have 100 people, it's hard to, it's hard to steer the town with just 100 people um, kind of pushing the, pushing the issues. Also, when it comes to voting, we only have a couple of thousand people. I mean, I, I went to South Bro's town meeting, and it was bursting at the seams. And, and South Bro and us are very similar uh, financially, you know, it, it just structurally, thousands of people in there, and it wasn't a, a hot topic. It was just a regular town meeting that I went in to see, and they take a very active role, and it's it's it would be great for me to see people in Hopkins and take more of an active role when they come into town, come vote, come to town meeting, uh, and make more of a more of a, a, a take more of an active stance. Thank you, Shahid Omanin. You pronounce it very well, thank you. <laughs> I've been practicing. <laughs> so I, I just want to add that obviously it shows that we are not in sync with our master plan or strategic plan, and that's exactly what I am referring to time and time again, that we do need to go back to the basics and have a very elaborate and well-understood and well-connected strategic plan. The master plan we have, uh, I've read it, and I often go back to it when I'm working on the budget committee. and. I, I really admire it because when it was done, it, a lot of effort was put in it, a lot of good thoughts, and built a lot of good framework that we have based our town's growth over the years. But then again, it's 12 years old. A strategic plan and master plan only can go three to five years in reality, and with course correction at the, uh, during the process. So obviously, somewhere down the path, we forgot about it. And then we are focused on urgent issue by issue, which is important, and forgot to look at the bigger picture. So I feel like we are looking at trees so closely that we are missing the forest. And that may actually come back to haunt us. That's my fear. And you've all heard 
how the growth is booming and how it's impacting all the various areas, if we don't have that larger view, we're not gonna know how we are gonna manage it, cope it, and be and where we are gonna be. I'm not gonna be a you know sky's falling uh, <laughs> note person, but I'm just saying this is something a great town like us, a great leadership that comes from this town. We need to address it, and in order to address it, I think again I mentioned it earlier that we need to take all these into account and make sure we understand the priorities. We understand where the money is coming from, where it's going, how the allocations can be best met. Our schools are the jewels of the town. I would certainly focus on that. We need to manage the taxes, and we need to look at new growth on the commercial side and uh, reduce the burden of these 84% taxes being on residential alone. All these combined, there can be a solution. We run businesses in a, in a more uh, holistic way and long-term vision, with long-term vision, and I think we need to bring that back, and that's how we can uh, set our success and be on the path for success. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Jo Lafreniere, please. Uh, I just want to say that growth eventually is going to level off. It always does. And having been uh, the professional assessor in two other towns, I've seen where growth increases and growth re levels off, and it's, it's a fluctuating thing. So when people are looking at construction because of a, a, a new growth figure that's going to come in for that year's taxes, you, you really can't do that. You really have to look at what the cost is going to be in the long run. And you know, I said this before, but it's so strategically important because that new growth figure is, is going, it's not a de definite figure. It is going to level off. And I think that uh, we count on it too much. We take uh, our last year's levy plus new growth to get a new levy for the next year. And it's, it's a big figure right now. It's, it's a, over a million, two million dollars. And it's, it's not always going to be there. So we have to now look at projections. We have to look at what the projections are for growing out, for the, for the growing out of the town. And I'm saying right now, I'm all for the planning board's idea of, of setting up a, a committee just to look at projections for the future. Thank it's you. essential. In the interest of time, we will uh, end the questioning now to the, allow the candidates a final opportunity to address the audience with closing remarks. Once again, there's a two-minute limit, and this time we'll reverse the order. So our first speaker will be the school committee candidate, Nancy Richards Cavanaugh. Thank you, and thank you all for coming and for those who tuned in from home to follow along in this important uh, process for our town. We heard a lot about growth tonight and a lot about concerns that people have. And I just want to say I think this is the time we're going to buckle down in the storm and, and make it through together. I think moving forward, the collaboration across town boards and committees is going to be increasingly important in making sure that we're bringing all of our residents along with us, that we're including the new people, that we're making sure that people aren't left behind because they can't afford their homes uh, because they feel left out somehow and the inclusion is it's important in the town it's important in the schools uh, and i look forward to uh, all, all of the candidates here i I'm impressed with everybody who has stepped up uh, and those who are running for re-election so just really want to thank you very much again for hosting us and uh, thank you for hcam uh, and look forward to seeing you all at town meeting uh, and again at the polls thank you thank you uh, for planning board the candidate for the one-year uh, position patrick atwell Uh, thanks again for having uh, this wonderful event this evening. Uh, like I said earlier, you know, growth, sudden boom, it's time to take control. Uh, with my experience, I said in law, studying law, applying law, I think I'd be a great asset to the planning board. Uh, I'm a team player. I'm eager to learn. I'm eager to work with everybody. And I think uh, everyone as a whole has to work together to make Hopkins in one. That's the planning board. It's got to work with the selectmen, got to work with zoning, and everyone else. All the boards are important. And uh, hopefully you'll give me your vote on May 20th. Thank you. Thank you. The planning board uh, candidate for the two-year position, uh, Michael McNamara. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks again for, for having me, having us. And I'd just say, you know, growth has been a hot topic, right? And it's a, it's a tough challenge. I, I, you know, it's, it's fun. I like taking on challenges. That's what I've, I've done in my career, always trying to look, look for that 
that next challenge, that, that next wave. As I said, I did um, finishing my term on the library trustees. That was awesome. I saw it go from the old to the new. Now I'm looking for a new challenge. And I think there's a lot of challenges on the planning board. You, you heard me get on my soapbox about affordable housing, how that's an issue in this town. That, that needs to be fixed, man. Two, two freaking empty homes that's been sitting empty for two, year, two to three years is wrong. It's a crime. So something's broken. I don't know if I can fix that, but I sure as hell will try and help. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Robert Benson, candidate for the two-year position for planning board. Uh, I'd like to thank the Hopkins Women's Club once again and HCAM for holding the evening. So I first attended uh, Hopkins Town Meeting in 2007 when it was up, uh, up for debate if the town was going to put on the ballot to buy the Mesut land, which is now Legacy Farms. So at that time, there was about 1,000 thousand people in the middle school auditorium, which was my high school auditorium, meant to hold about 600 people. That's the, high, that's the auditorium where I graduated from high school. It was about 95 degrees in there. The meeting went to uh, hours. The first vote of three happened at about 11 p.m. I had never been to one before. I didn't know someone could call for a revote. A revote happens. People are leaving. People are coming. And um, that was my first glimpse into hopping town government and why it was so important to be involved and why I'm running today. I think it's important for people like myself who have a vested interest in the town, are not going anywhere, and want to bring a bright future for the future generations of Hopkins and the people, the citizens of town. So, like I said, I've lived in Hopkins most of my life. I volunteer at Hopkins Youth Basketball, Hopkins Youth Soccer, Little League. I played in those leagues growing up, graduated from Hopkins, played sports there, and uh, never been a politician working in town government. I look at it now as an opportunity for me to give back. Um, I've been busy uh, starting my life with my wife, uh, focusing on my career, and raising our twin uh, eight-year-old boys that are in third grade. And so I'd really appreciate your vote on May 20th. I'll do my best to bring everybody's voices that I can talk to uh, to, to the planning board and uh, help those in, that input in planning board meetings and planning board votes. But by and large, it's a position of one in a nine-member board, and I want to work with the other members to help shape the future of Hopkins. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Gary Trendell. A planning board candidate for the five-year position. Um, thanks again to the Women's Committee and to uh, HCAM. I just want to hit on a couple of things that were said um, that I think are, are worth clarifying. Number one, from a master plan. Uh, the master plan was updated in 2017, and um, if you haven't read it, I, I encourage you to. It, um, in some ways, it may be a little bit of utopia. It tries to be everything to everybody, but um, I, I think it's a, a really worthwhile document, and I, I think it does project a vision for, for what we want to be. Um, secondly, I know we talked a lot about growth, um, and, and this isn't the first time Hopkinson's dealt with this. Um, and you know, even going back to our planning board meeting on Monday, we talked about a subcommittee and a report from 1995 of which the town was faced with this um, very, very rapid growth challenge, um, and, and the town dealt with it. And, and we continued to thrive, and, and the reality is we're going to continue to thrive again now. And I, I think to some degree, growth is a function of being a really desirable place to live. And, for all of us, not all of us, um, Brendan was born here, but <laughs> most of us moved here at some point in our lives, and, and we're part of that growth statistic. So I don't, the, the sky isn't necessarily falling. Um, there are ways that we can get through this, and it's, it's time for us to, to rally around to do that. And the last point I make, and I realize I'm preaching to the choir here, but um, we're a community that's run uh, by volunteers. And, and I applaud everyone for being involved and for being here. Um, but I'd also say that, that we rely on, on public input. I've never been to a, a meeting where there wasn't an opportunity to give input, and yet, as we talk about the Zoning Advisory Committee that makes recommendations on our zoning bylaws, I think back to the, the public hearing, not the, the public input session earlier this year, and I think there was maybe four people that, that showed up. So um, I realize it's a lot of time for people, but, um, and, and you know, everybody has other things going on in their lives, but um, you know, I encourage everyone to continue to be involved and to come to these meetings and to, to advocate and for your, your needs and, and speak your voice. So thank you all. Appreciate you being here, and have a good night. Thank you. Uh, the next two candidates are for Parks and Recreation Commission. We'll start with Peter Edwards. Uh, thank you again to the Women's Club for inviting us. This has been uh, very informative. Um, obviously, a lot of talk about growth, not much Parks and Rec, which is fine. 
Um, and I can't stop thinking about kind of like the situation of the growth. So I just wanted to say this is if you've ever been on like the T, say after a Red Sox game and there's thousands of people trying to get on the same subway, we're basically in that situation. We're tight. We're standing next to each other. Um, but things will kind of shake out. You get a little more comfortable. You get to know the person next to you and everything is fine. You'll make it home. So I think I really enjoy it. I think a lot of people have the same spirit and I agree with, you know, I think Hot Beacon's always been a step above a lot of other places in that we are very inclusionary. Um, and then from a Parks and Rec standpoint, you know, my, my goal would just to be to maintain and continue the services that we have and hopefully enhance them. So thank you. Thank you. Cynthia Estima. We are fortunate to have a wonderful Parks and Recreation Department in this town. It is not broken and does not need to be fixed. However, we do need to support, and the job of a commissioner of Parks and Rec is an oversight role. And as such, I think a strength of mine will be to listen to support the director for all that he does for us, for adults, for children, the outstanding programming that we have that covers the STEM program, the babysitting and CPR programs, adult and children, sports, the Fruit Street, the coming dog part. There is just so much going on that needs the support from a good commission. So please consider my vote for Parks and Rec. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from the Board of uh, Library Trustees, three-year positions for two candidates. And we'll start with Susan Porter. Um, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to come here and um, to present my views and also to learn a lot about the candidates that are also running. Um, having lived here for over 40 three years, uh, I've lived through a lot of the growth of this town. When we moved here, this was a very small farming community, more than a anything else. And to see it develop into um, a huge, a, a high-tech, wealthy community um, has been amazing. But all of the issues that have been raised, we I understand aging in place, <laughs> being one of them. Um, but uh, I also want to thank everybody who helped and supported the growth of the library to help um, um, maintain and educate and uh, service all of the growth that we're having. And um, I guess I just want to say thank you, and I hope you vote for me. <laughs> thank you. Janice Barry. Yes, just a thank you to the Women's Club, thank you to HCAM, to all of my fellow candidates. Um, I look forward to seeing you at the library. I look forward to seeing you at town meeting and on election day. Good evening. <laughs> thank you. Uh, for Commissioner of Trust Funds, for the three-year position, all Susan right, so Curious. I'm going to go fast this time. Um, I want you all to leave here tonight with the confidence that I'm well qualified for this position. And I just wanted to roughly, here we go again, um, quickly touch on um, experience and background, um, which in addition to um, serving on a town committee, um, I also serve on nonprofit boards where I'm responsible for financial management and importantly for ensuring that the expenditures of those funds are aligned with that organization's mission and values. Um, my educational background includes an MBA from Stanford and recent coursework at BU. Uh, specifically in fundraising, estate planning, and grants management. But I also want to give you a little bit of an experience um, of my values, and that is tonight we've talked a lot about supporting seniors and helping them stay here in town. So I'm going to make a pitch. I can't solve, and a lot of us individually can't solve the larger problems that we face, but even though we're not all elected officials and we have don't have um, these you know, big weighty decisions in front of us, we can each do something. If you go out onto the town website, there's a place where you can make a donation to the tax relief fund. Most people don't know that this fund is completely supported by donations from individuals and organizations in town, and that's it. It is a community fund. The last thing that I just want to say, and I hope this is apparent to everybody, that the trust funds that have been given to us 
were created by individuals who love our town. And as such, it would be my honor, my privilege, to be able to carry the torch of the intent and the values of those people for the benefit of everyone in Hopkinton. Thank you, and I hope you vote for me on May 20th. Thank you. Gunajit Mehdi, uh, candidate for the three-year position on the Board of Assessors. Thank you. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank the Hopkinton Women's Club uh, and HCAM uh, for hosting this event. Um, as I mentioned during my opening statement, um, I'm here in town for the long term. Um, my three kids have established roots here and they're flourishing. And I'd like to keep Hopkinton uh, a, a place where uh, both long-term residents and newcomers are welcomed. Um, if elected to the board, as I mentioned earlier, um, I will patiently listen um, and I'll work with our fellow uh, board members and, and also uh, elected officials in town on creating uh, innovative solutions. Our challenge that we have from a growth perspective, I'd like to look at it as an opportunity. Um, opportunity is from a revenue standpoint. We've had several um, great ideas mentioned, um, and I will offer uh, many more innovative solutions. Uh, we do have a new Dick Egan in town. His name is Michael Dell. Um, and, and we do need to come up with many other ideas to many other Michael Dells around the country to, in, to invest in our town. Our solution is from a revenue perspective. Our target zone should be South Street where we expand businesses. Again, I respectfully request your vote on May 20th. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Board of Selectmen candidates for the three-year positions. We'll start with Claire Wright, please. Serving you on the Board of Selectmen and this year's chairman, I hope that I've earned your trust and respect. The decisions are not always easy, and sometimes not everyone is happy. Sometimes I'm not happy when it comes time to make the hard votes, but that's part of the highest position in our town, the town's chief executive office. While serving you, I've tried, and will continue, if reelected, to listen to you and respect you. I work to understand the many factors and seek to the best of my ability and position to find answers that address the public's concerns. I believe in a one Hopkinton approach to issues and problem solving. We appreciate that we're a community of varied ages, varied incomes, and varied cultures, and we're enriched by that diversity. We must recognize the financial and community strength that is brought by new growth while we seek to develop in ways that support rather than sacrifice our town character. The win-win is always my objective. Through collaboration rather than conflict, I believe we can find balanced solutions that are reasonable, practical, and effective. This is the one Hopkinton ideal, to promote Hopkinton that serves all of its citizens well. I hope to have your vote on May 20th and the honor to continue to serve you. Thank you and good night. Brendan Tedstone. So obviously my pride for Hopkinton is worn on my sleeve. <laughs> I have knowledge of and uh, appreciate our history and our community, and I know it's that which makes Hopkinton such a great place to live and work. I've instilled my love of Hopkinton in my kids and can confidently say that all of the decisions I've made, every one, throughout my tenure as selectman, has been for the good of the town and not necessarily what I would have voted on personally. Hopkinton will fa face many difficult challenges in the next few years, decisions that may not be popular with many, but should be made by someone who has a firm grasp of where the town has been, where it is now, and where we want it to be in years to come. I want the best for Hopkinton. I want your vote on May 20th but only if I'm the best person that you see is most qualified to lead us. I want the best for Hopkinton. If any of these other candidates you feel are better than me, I implore you to vote for them. I want the best for Hopkinton. I'm very confident that you'll not find someone who has more passion, love, or dedication for our town. I went into the last election thinking that I had a firm grasp of Hopkinton and all its inner workings. Well, I didn't. Fortunately, when you elected me, I went into the position with my eyes and ears wide open as well. This has been an incredible three-year journey for me, which I hope will continue for at least three more years. I humbly 
ask your vote on May 20th to include Brendan Tedstone. I will not let you down. Thank you. Thank you, Shahid al -Manin. Thank you, Kathy. And uh, I would take a little bit of time because I think I want a response to um, uh, Gary's comments, which I think touched some of my comments. So um, I'll start with that and then go to my closing. I just want to mention that I have deep respect for all the leaders who has brought, a, brought the town to this level. And what we are now talking about is having a candid conversation about what are the rooms for improvement and where the real issues might be. So just to let you know on that, Gary, I think uh, where we are coming from is that the master plan, changing the date is not an update in my view. And we, I know we've done a lot of good work on that, but if you look at it, it doesn't address the school uh, expansion needs that we are talking about. It doesn't address the growth that we are experiencing and seeing a lot of pressure on various services, fire uh, service included. It doesn't relate to all of these in today's um, context, and that's what we need as a strategic plan. And talking to many of the town officials, being part of the budget committee, talking to many of the town leaders, it's clear that um, it's not on the radar as much. And it's not to blame anyone, but just to raise the awareness on that. And thank you for repeating. I do believe the sky is not falling. So we are on the same page. And uh, appreciate that, certainly. So sorry about that. I now go back to my uh, closing statement, if you may. So first of all, I want to thank to all fellow candidates for a wonderful and lively discussion. Uh, it is an honor to run with such a wonderful group of leaders, and we've seen a lot of um, thought leadership in this room. I believe I'm uniquely qualified with my experience and expertise working in Appropriations Committee for four years and decades of corporate leadership. As a leader of the town, I can add new strategic perspective, budget oversight, and planning to manage growth. With tremendous growth among the highest in Massachusetts, Hopkinton is facing challenges in keeping up services with schools, police, fire, DPW, traffic congestion. I will work on comprehensive strategic plan, connecting growth to budget and detailed execution roadmap to ensure our town's future. Uh, I apologize, do I get the extra time or not? No. Okay. It's getting close to my bedtime. No problem. So, <laughs> I love this town. We are invested here, raising our kids and building our lives here. As your next selectman, I will listen to your voice. I will represent every citizen of Hopkinton. I will work with fellow fine selectmen, town administration, Thank you. school, and other committees. I humbly ask for your vote on May 20th. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mary Jo Lafrenia. I, too, remember experiences with growth in the past in this town, and I don't think that the sky is falling. However, I think one of our biggest challenges is to how to deal with those that are having a real problem managing the situation of new growth. Our seniors on fixed income and various other people that are having a really hard time with their taxes, we have to find a way to help those people and get them involved. I also uh, agree with Gary that we need more volunteerism. And through volunteerism, you learn a lot. You become a part of the community. Uh, I have been a volunteer on five or six boards. I just spent my 35th year on the Marathon Committee, which is going to be my last. Uh, I have been a founding member of your Trust Fund Commission, and I have uh, been on the Marathon Fund Committee and the Tax Relief Committee, uh, along as an elected member of your Board of Assessors. I feel that I have, again, I'm going to say, my experience in state, municipal, and fiduciary responsibilities brings me a unique perspective to, ab to be able to help bring the town forward as, an, as a selectman. Uh, one of the things that m brought my attention to this town when I first came here was the pride. Everybody in this town had great pride all ages, youth to seniors. And I want to keep that pride in Hopkinton. I want people to, to know this community, to belong to this community, and I want to see much more volunteerism in, in the community so that we get a different perspective from more people. Uh, and as I guess I'm going to say, as a proud Hopkintonian, I am going to ask for your vote on May 20th. Thank you. Thank you. 
candidate for town moderator, a three-year position, Ellen Rutter. So what we heard tonight was a lot of stuff is going on in Hopkinton. And where that plays out to some degree is at town meeting. Town meeting is where all of us have the opportunity to participate, to weigh in, to learn, to listen. And it's at town meeting that I will bring my strong meeting facilitation skills and experience to bear as your town moderator. I bring a fresh perspective to town meeting. I bring a fresh perspective to the role. I will ensure that all voices are heard, that our town meeting is efficient, and we keep moving Hopkinton forward. I'd appreciate your vote on May 20th. Thank you. Thank you. Thomas Garabedian, candidate for town moder moderator position for three years. Okay, a couple of random thoughts. First, th there's been a lot of discussion about growth <coughs> and casting growth in, in somewhat of a negative light. As town moderator, I'm in favor of growth, specifically in terms of the number of people who come out to town meeting. <laughs> You know, someone made the comment that we have, you know, we have at times had difficulties with quorums and, you know, slightly more than 100 people make decisions that control the fate of the town for the upcoming year. Well, the way, the way that uh, town meeting can be more effective is to have more people come. And in the process of having more people come, uh, and with a commitment that's usually about eight hours long over two evenings, it is important that the meeting be run appropriately and that it be run effectively, that the dignity, dignity of each of the participants is honored, uh, and I think I've demonstrated the ability to do that over the past several years, uh, both re um, recognizing the dignity of the people who are speaking at town meeting, as well as uh, recognizing the gravity of the discussions that we're having. By the same token, I think I bring a, a soft touch to it and a, and a little bit of a sense of humor to, to keep things uh, light over that eight eight hour period. In that regard, uh, Brenda and I promise not to wear orange. If that, <laughs> if that facilitates an additional vote, uh, terrific. Again, I'll repeat my commitment uh, to be informed on the issues, to use the, the knowledge that I've gained uh, from attending planning board meetings, from attending uh, select, selectmen, select board meetings, uh, watching televised sessions that impact the issues that confront the town and that, that help move the meeting along. I'd be honored uh, with your vote on May 20th. Thank you. Thank you. And the candidate for town clerk for the three-year position, Connor Deegan. Thank you. Thank you again to the Women's Club and HCAM for hosting us this evening. I just wanted to leave with that Hopkinton is my hometown. I grew up here and this is a place where over the course of my childhood and young adulthood, I witnessed neighborly acts that inspired me in this community. Uh, I've made it my goal to ensure that all of you as my neighbors, my friends, and in some cases my family, have an encouraging experience with town government, which in many cases people can feel like it's bashing their head against the wall constantly. <laughs> I've tried to do this with kind of four policy pillars uh, one, to provide excellent customer service to everyone who walks through the door. The town clerk's office is sometimes, I think, lovingly referred to as the face of town hall, and I like to make sure that that face is always smiling, whether it's me or my assistant clerk that you get. Uh, I want to ensure the professional nature of the office through professional development, and I want to increase community building so that people can experience what I experienced growing up here. I think that's vital to ensuring that issues of this town can be addressed together in an impressive manner. And finally, through that, I have been passionate about increasing civic engagement, whether it be through registering seniors and students to vote or ensuring that there are new ways to reduce roadblocks to go to town meeting and elections. I would really humbly ask for your vote and hope that all of you can show up for town meeting and also for the election on May 20th. Thank you very much. Have a pleasant evening. Thank you, Connor. On behalf of the Hopkinton Women's Club, I would like to extend a special thank you to the candidates who participated in the event tonight and to our studio audience and the television viewers for joining us this evening. 
I also want to acknowledge the HCAM TV staff and crew for making this broadcast possible, and the Hopkinton Women's Club members and the two Hopkinton High School students who volunteered tonight. We hope this program has been informative, and we encourage all registered voters to vote in our town election on Monday, May 20th. All Hopkinton precincts vote at the middle school between the hours of 7 a.m. and 8 p.m. Absentee ballots are available at the town clerk's office. We now invite all the people that are here in our live audience to join us for an informal reception, home-baked cookies, and uh, connect with the other candidates. Thank you, everyone, and good evening.